so yeah, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the protocols um, that are kind of powering the IoT stuff we're seeing today. So um, we're probably not gonna do much FUD about like hacking baby monitors and like, you know, people are gonna kill you dead and you know, do something you pacemaker, right? Like those are things that are out there, right? Um, but we're really just today gonna to talk about the protocols themselves, uh, the security baked into them, things you're on the hook for as a developer, or somebody integrating these things, and um, we'll take it from there. So uh, just really quick, that's me. Um, any Mets fans in here? I'm in Texas and I'm bragging about it because it's been like 15 years since we've been to a World Series. Now, the only person clapping here, come on. Um, uh, so that's what I do, I, I like the Mets. I uh, do most of my development stuff nowadays in Scala. I'm a huge Scala fan. Um, Android developer, but I use an iPhone and iOS devices because I have respect for myself. Um, but I definitely develop a little bit more on Android side. So uh, so what are we really talking about here? So um, we have lots of protocols, right? We have HTTP, tons of protocols, right? They're already out there. So why do we use different protocols for connecting devices together? And the answer is um, we want to basically take the people out of the equation, right? So um, we want our devices to be able to communicate with each other. Um, so you're taking the human person out of it, right? It's a little bit less synchronous. It's not someone sitting behind a browser, you know, making an HTTP request, something comes back, right? Um, you know, we may have different things, whether, you know, pick a nuclear plant, pick uh, an oil pipeline, uh, pick a bunch of connected cars. Um, we want to enable those things to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, additionally, the other piece is um, some devices, so a car obviously is going to have more juice than um, really a little tiny sensor that you'd expect to be, you know, battery powered in the field for five or six years, right? So um, the class of device is going to probably impact a lot of the security tools you have at your disposal, um, but it's gonna be very dependent on the device itself. Uh, so why are these protocols so popular? Uh, so one of the first things, smaller than HTTP, um, especially on the co-op side, as we look at it, uh, it's UDP, really tiny uh, request as opposed to basically what HTTP looks like. Um, additionally, these protocols have uh, published, so for example, uh, MQTT is a published subscribe type of protocol. Uh, whereas uh, co-op has extensions for doing like observer-based type of stuff. So um, you could say, hey, I want to get additional updates from this uh, light bulb when things happen, right? Uh, so those protocols make those things possible. Now, uh, HTTP2 has maybe a little more in that realm, right? But uh, as far as HTTP1 is concerned, those are pretty much reasons why you wouldn't want to use HTTP as your sole protocol there. What does MQDP and COAP stand for? Uh, message queue, telemetry, uh, <laughs> I draw blanks when I'm up on stage, so yeah, transport. So, we go back. Yeah. Seriously, like you know things, and when you stand in front of a crowd, it's just like I rather do that. Um, the other thing also is QoS, right? Um, so, working on, uh, for example, a UDP protocol, right? So, UDP is fire and forget. Um, so, there's things built into Co op, for example, that uh, gets around that kind of stuff, you know, for example, with confirmable types of messages, you want to at least make sure the endpoint got the message, right? So um, if it's, you know, data related to like a pacemaker, so like you probably don't want to miss those um, requests, right? Uh, same thing for MQTT. There's actually QoS built into the protocol itself, which will cover each of those modes. Uh, but those are things that are very appealing. Uh, in terms of commercial and open source implementations, uh, these things have been implemented in pretty much every programming language you I guess want to use. Uh, if you're a COBOL developer, I don't know if there's COBOL and QTT, anybody chime in on that? Um, but um, as far as, I mean, if you're a Go developer, you're a Ruby developer, you're a Python developer, you're a JavaScript developer, um, there's basically, you know, client libraries out there. And obviously for embedded C types of stuff as well. Um, so here's just some examples, right? So uh, AWS recently released their um, IoT backend. Uh, that's actually powered by MQTT is the protocol. <coughs> Um, IBM, I mean, so MQTT came from IBM, right? Um, they're obviously a big adopter. Um, Arm and the Embed platform, uh, lots of support for things like Co-app. And Eclipse has a ton of cool projects out there. Um, things around MQTT, things around uh, Co-app, uh, things around, you know, lightweight machine-to-machine -machine types of management protocols. Uh, a lot of really cool stuff out of Eclipse project, uh, smart home types of stuff. Um, all open source. Um, Paho, for example, is a client they use, um, which is actually AWS uses that for their C client, um, for their IoT SDK. Um, but those are some of the big ones out there. There's, I mean, tons of open source implementations out there, right? 
so what can we build? Um, so this is an oil pipeline. So uh, MQT actually came around originally um, for pipelines, right? So that's kind of where it was born, and the protocol has obviously evolved since then. Um, Dave talked a lot in the last talk about, you know, just what we can connect, right? So you guys all probably keep up with the things we're connecting nowadays. Just use your imagination, slap a sensor on it, and shove some data up to a backend, right? And you have a connected device. Uh, here's an example of reference kind of architecture. So um, we're not just seeing, for example, like here's, I don't know, like a Raspberry Pi or something like that. We're seeing uh, that Raspberry Pi may talk to something in the middle, uh, which is ultimately going to pump you up to, you know, so analytics are a big thing, right? We can get a lot of data from a lot of devices. Um, we want to put that all in one place and analyze it. So um, this is just an example, right? But you can, in theory, have, you know, mobile device uh, talking back to, say, you know, an MQTT broker um, or a co-op proxy or something like that, um, going to maybe back end, hitting a web service, and then maybe push notification to your mobile app, right? Um, so it extends beyond just the connected devices you might have in the field and stuff like that. Um, you may actually have like end-to-end -end communication channels between a mobile device, um, wearable device, right? Talking up to service, talking to other services. So the, the architectures can get really complex. It's not um, just about here's the device, right? It's about everything else that device is going to talk to, transient networks, right? So you think about between layers there. Uh, what about you know transport encryption stuff like that, right? Lots of considerations around the architecture itself. Um, so here's just a great stat, right? So uh, stats are good, but um, I mean, there are a lot of new developers, right? So we sold a couple years with mobile, everybody's like, woohoo, I want to be an Android developer. Um, so, you know, now we're seeing every day, know, companies getting funding left and right to do connected things. Um, so whenever you have money, you have people in waves behind it. Uh, so we're kind of seeing that trend now. A lot of people that haven't been writing code forever are all aboard. So, um, which brings you to this, right? So who can tell me what the problem is with that? Um, this is actually a pseudo random number generator from a co-op library. Um, but if you read the comments, so first of all, who can tell me what the problem is with that? Just blurt it out if you see it. Ah. <laughs> Possibly, but uh, rand, right? So, uh, yeah, right. So there's, you know, I mean, in the comments, you can see clear as day. They're like, we get this is probably not the best thing in the world, but if you implement this library, maybe you should consider using a better number generator, right? Um, so you think about it, right? So, you know, most security people don't dig through the, I mean, who, who digs through every library they, they drop into their application from top to bottom? Like, um, or do you just basically, you know, just shove it into your Gradle file and be like, woohoo, right? I mean, to be honest, that's what most developers do. Uh, so, you know, stuff like this just only, I guess, further adds to the problem, right? So developers do have to have some understanding of what they're actually putting into their products. So um, when you have stuff like that, yeah, they're probably just going to leave that there in devices that they deploy. Um, so really, it is a software thing. So, I mean, there's things that are new. Um, and to be perfectly honest, there's a lot of things we already know about, right? Um, bad users send things to your application, right? They fuzz your back end. They try to inject things, you know, screw with, um, you know, different interpreters, et cetera, right? Um, that kind of stuff hasn't changed. Um, in reality, you have devices that are sending stuff to a service that may call a database, right? That may basically forward it on to another service. Um, so a lot of those things, pretty similar. Um, parsers are especially interesting across the board. Um, crypto libraries, right? So uh, surprise, surprise, you know, things like OpenSSL, um, ARMS, for example, like their embed TLS libraries had some bugs recently. Um, no shortage of that, right? I mean, the one thing that does kind of suck is that um, a lot of devices don't have great, say, software update mechanisms, right? So they may be able to push a couple packages, but they might not be able to push, you know, say, um, kernel updates, et cetera, right? So it's something to consider is that um, some devices out there in the real world may not actually get updates to these things, right? So I mean, it's one of those things you definitely got to contend with. Um, identity is definitely not easy, uh, but one of the things too is authorization. Um, so there's some bolt-on things to these protocols, uh, the specifications, but um, some of those things aren't really uh, deeply embedded in the main specs themselves. Um, but implementations do add a lot. So AWS has added some stuff. Um, IBM World does a lot of different. Uh, it's just basically like the raw specs themselves don't really have a lot of these edge cases built in for you. Uh, 
so let's talk a little bit about co-op. So uh, co-op is a UDP protocol. Um, it's very restful in design. So when we look at the different uh, codes you can have, so you have a get, post, put, delete, right? Those sound very much like restful types of things to me. Um, and that was a lot of the intention with the protocol was to make it very compatible with HTTP. So you can do uh, cross protocol, basically. So you can do, you know, for example, <laughs> Um, you can do co-op to co-op, you can do co-op to HTTP, um, you can do co-op cross protocol to, you know, pretty much any protocol that you actually basically write, you know, something to translate from protocol to protocol, right? So it's definitely a consideration that you may be co-op one side, you may be working with a different protocol on the back end, right? So you end up encapsulating a lot of those things, shoving those inside of different options and stuff like that inside of the co-op uh, packets. Um, so here's examples, right? One of them that's in particular is uh, for device management. Um, so you can do things like push firmware updates over co-app, um, which obviously comes with its own, I guess, can of worms in itself, right? Um, but you can push things like configurations. Um, it's a protocol that actually uses co-app. You will find out there that there's protocols that are actually built on top of things like co-app, right? Um, as just a piece of it. But this is one that's pretty much inseparable. Uh, used for basically device management. Um, so here's just a picture that kind of gives you an idea of, I guess, the size difference there. Um, so co-op is a little itty bitty thing, right? Um, DTLS is what we'll talk about in a little bit. So DTLS is what you're gonna use to basically encrypt your communications. Um, I mean, it adds a little bit of overhead and you'll hear things like, we can't do that because it's gonna kill batteries faster or um, device wasn't meant to handle that, et cetera, right? So um, sometimes you see it, and sometimes you see basically implementations that are wide open, right? Um, here's an example of what you could see in the real world in terms of you know, how co-op may be stacked. Um, so over on the right side, um, and in the middle you might have a proxy. Uh, so think of what you know about a proxy and apply it there, right? Um, so you can have proxy, you can have reverse proxy as well, which may do reverse proxy connections back um, to the co-op devices themselves. I mean, everything's treated as an endpoint, right? So the clients are endpoints, um, and basically clients can work in you know, server mode, for example, too, right? Um, but this is kind of an illustration, and you can see on the back end, like you may have HTTP, right? Um, do you take any guesses? How many times do you think uh, what's basically on the right-hand side of the proxy is either plain text that may be encrypted, and then on the left-hand side, the communications are maybe plain text, right? So that's one of those things where um, you have to think about it in each layer. Like the specs say you should do these things, but there's nothing actually forcing the implementation of the protocols to actually make you do it. It's just like what we've seen before, right? People like to use plain text protocols over the web. So um, here's an example here of just kind of what you'll see, right? So um, this gives you a good illustration. So um, you might have a light bulb, for example, that, you know, um, Going to basically take its cues from say you know did it get dark out well it's like making a little bit brighter right is it light out we'll turn the lights off um, so basically you can set up observers so when various events happen you can automatically get those updates right so at the flip side of that from a security perspective if you're able to stop um, something from getting updates to things right well then that's you know pretty much you know apply that to something you know a little bit more dangerous than say a light bulb right um, where it's maybe, I don't know, my insulin level shot up. What, what happens now? And, you know, if you could basically, you know, stop a device from getting those updates, well, then you've, you've got a can of worms in your hands. Um, we'll talk about how that's possible in a second. Um, here's basically what the format looks like. Um, the key things there we'll talk about quite a bit are going to be the message ID and the token. So message ID, message identifier, the token has a security use, but the implementations usually suck around it. Um, here's just kind of what it looks like. So for example, you can see there's a get request, right? Um, so con, and you basically get like to a con, you get an acknowledgement of it. Um, but what you can see there, the key things to take away from that slide are, um, so the token, so if you look in the request, right, you see a token that's generated, you see the response, that token's echoed back. Um, that's one of the mechanisms that Co-op uses to make sure that the person or the device requesting is the same device that's, or you know, the person that's responding is the expected one. Um, but that token definitely comes into play for that, right? So uh, it can be eight bytes, zero to eight bytes, but um, we'll talk about that more in a second. But um, 
That should look somewhat HTTP-like to you guys, right? Um, similarities for sure. Uh, so here's, I guess, the big ones. Um, so con and, for example, acknowledgement, right? Um, just think about you. That's kind of straightforward. Um, resets, though, are important. Um, so resets, basically, if you were to send a reset uh, back to a device that, say, you were getting um, you know, observer updates from, right, would potentially tell that device you're no longer interested in that. So if you can spoof those messages, jackpot. Um, and by the way, it's, it's a plain text protocol, right? So it's over UDP. Um, by default, DTLS isn't uh, enabled most implementations. So um, you kind of run into that, right? It's a plain text protocol. You can see everything over the wire. Um, so there's no built-in authorization. Um, DTLS lets you work in a couple different modes. Um, so you can do pre-shared keys. You can do certificates. Um, you can do nothing, <laughs> which is what a lot of implementations do. Um, but the key things there are um, really in that message ID and the token. Um, so just kind of going back to this here. So the message ID, it generally isn't anything random or anything close to random. Uh, so there's really no security like usage for it at all, right? Um, the token, on the other hand, uh, potentially allows you to prevent people from spoofing things. But at the same time, this is an example of a token generator. Um, they might have updated them. I hopefully they've updated this by now. Um, but who can see the, the problem with uh, generating a token in that manner, right? Hmm? It's predictable. I mean, just basically doing just kind of shifts here, right? Uh, so there's really nothing fancy about that. It's an incremental counter and then um, just doing some shifts on those values, right? So uh, how hard do you think it is to potentially spoof that token? Like um, up to eight uh, bytes, right? Um, not super hard. And I mean, if you get one, then pretty much you own the rest of the ones going forward, right? Because you know where to start. Um, so implementations vary. Like some actually get it right, some do this, and that's... Um, certainly an issue if that's your sole security mechanism for preventing things from being spoofed, right? Uh, so just kind of things you can do. So if you could spoof reset messages, then you could potentially kill off people subscribing to things. Um, if you could do things like, for example, spoof response, so those proxy servers can all, also operate in a caching mode. Uh, so just think about like anything else, poison a DNS cache. If you can stuff stuff in there that shouldn't be in there, um, you can do some damage if people are relying on that cache. Um, for basically subsequent updates. Uh, the other thing too is if you can get devices to just keep waking up. Um, I mean, a lot of devices are you know fielded and saying like, hey, the battery life is expected to last five years, right? And if you can make that happen in six months, um, you could probably cause some havoc, right? So uh, other things you could do, I mean, just that in terms of a DOS around devices is if you can find ways to drain that battery faster, all the better for you. Uh, in terms of DTLS, so DTLS is a little different than TLS, but um, a lot of shared code in most libraries you're going to look at. Um, the big things for DTLS are, you know, for example, how it does keep lives as opposed to like TLS, right? So it's, it's basically taking, you know, stateless type of, you know, UDP protocol um, and keeping some established, you know, connections on both ends, right? Um, there's a handful of suites that are supported. Um, generally, it'll vary on you know what kind of device you're working with. Um, here's the four DTLS modes, though. This is important. So, um, no sec is what's enabled by default. So it's exactly what it sounds like, right? There's no security built into it. Uh, everything's plain text. There's no authentication because uh, you can actually use uh, DTLS in a way, especially if you're doing you know uh, you know giving people certificates. Um, you could use that for authentication, right? Um, but the protocol gives you none of that out of the box. Um, pre-shared key is exactly what you think. So you provision a pre-shared key, you push it to a device. Um, sometimes you see all the pre-shared keys are exactly the same across the board. Sometimes um, they're custom, you know, across devices. Um, but it does give you a couple different options uh, for how you set that up. But again, no sec is what it defaults to. And you probably see a lot of that in the real world, quite a bit. Uh, I know someone asked the last talk what the percentage was. I don't know. <laughs> I can make up a number, we'll call it 40%, but total crap, I just made that number up on the fly. Um, but truth be told, yeah, there's a lot of implementations that they're gonna leave a plain text. Um, so in terms of encryption on devices, right, uh, take your pick. Uh, 
Um, so here's just an example. I mean, there's, there's lots of things on these constrained vices. Things like timing attacks, for example, um, are pretty prevalent. Um, you know, so some devices you may have, uh, you know, some crypto primitives there. Uh, you, it's pretty much across the board, right? So there's, there's, there's devices that give you a lot of options. There's devices that restrict you. Um, just kind of the nature of it. But uh, encryption is definitely hard uh, on small devices. Uh, multicast is a great thing. Um, so it allows you to basically think of what you know about like network multicasts and apply that here. Um, but you can also at the same time, so think of like the Smurf attack back in the day where, you know, you send one request and it's just basically amplified across. Um, so you can do things like that, for example, with co-op, sending like huge responses back to these things. Um, you can do a lot of stuff in DOS worlds. Um, but that also basically assumes that, uh, so if you're working in the DTLS list worlds, um, you obviously have less things at your disposal, right? So if you're doing certificate-based stuff, um, then in theory you can ignore uh, stuff coming, um, but the consequence is that for group keying, so there's additional RFCs that have kind of addressed this, but um, not out of basically the box. And not all implementations actually do support um, all of this stuff over multi-cast, multi-group communications as well. Um, core link is one of the interesting things, so um, think of what you know about web linking. Um, so you could do it over unicast, you could do it over multicast. Um, really the goal of uh, core link and resource directory is for devices to be able to figure out where various stuff exists, right? So you don't have a human in the equation and you want different devices to figure out, you know, who's interested in this, who's serving up a certain type of thing, right? So um, the protocol makes it as easy as possible for devices to figure these things out on their own. Um, so here's an example of what the format looks like, right? So um, one thing you'll always see, um, now you can also limit what's basically returned by it. Um, but if you ever want to just look at like the well-known core resource, um, that'll come back and tell you pretty much everything that's available to kind of sort of be called, right? Um, you could do things like restrict, obviously, you know, who sees what. Um, but just that's one thing. If you're ever working on an application or building something, check out what's exposed, right? Because every device can see uh, what's being exposed there. Um, it does support wildcards, which makes them a little bit harder. Um, you know, both from enforce, uh, enforcing authorization as well as uh, the complexity of maybe some of the parsers you write for these things. Um, but wildcards are fully supported. Um, here's just an example of uh, a tool called Copper. So it's just basically a, a Firefox plugin, um, and it does call out for you. So this is an example of a call to that you know well-known core resource, and it basically returns you know everything that's available there. Um, it'll tell you resource type, um, so on and so forth, right? But this is just what that directory looks like um, and what you can basically glean from enumerating those resources. So uh, translation is, you know, that stuff that you can invoke as either a device or potentially malicious device, right? Um, you can do things to basically, you know, hide who sees what, right? Um, but at the same time, you think about the internet, right? So how many people have ever looked at an application and it's like, the administrative functionality, like if you're an admin, you log in and you see everything, you see the pretty little admin thing in the nav bar. Then if you sign in as a regular user, you don't see that. And then you log in as a regular user and basically forcefully browse through it and you can get to that resource, right? Um, so same scenario, right? Just because you're hiding it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be protected. Uh, you run across the same kind of things as well there. Uh, any questions on co-op? That was just, I mean, as, as much of an intro as I can get through in this time frame, yes? Is it, is it possible to assume IPsec support instead of DTLS? There is IPsec support, yeah. You can do IPsec with basically, DT, yeah, you can do that as well, so. They require um, shared secret, but that can be assumed. Mm -hmm. Potentially, yeah, IPsec is supported, yeah. That's what I put in here, but yes. Um, there's some stuff, like if you look at like the DT, DCAF, like um, there's a specification around like authorization. DCAF. Um, if you go to like coap.me, coap.technology, there's, there's a bunch of stuff out there. Um, a lot of it is kind of scattered around the web, to be honest, but. Yeah. Um, so talk about MQTT a little bit. So MQTT is the one that's definitely got a lot of uh, traction, right? So um, you pick a big implementation, right? So, you know, IBM world and um, AWS world, like everybody's behind MQTT. Um, it was also used at one point in Facebook Messenger as well, um, just as an FYI. Um, but the big thing about MQTT is it's a publish and subscribe type of protocol. 
um, to where basically the publisher and uh, the subscriber um, don't really have to know much about each other, right? Um, you could also, also support web sockets as well, um, so that's nice. Uh, and QoS is a big part of it, which we'll talk about in a second. So here's an example of what you might see from like, you know, an MQTT kind of implementation. Um, so you have, you know, your devices, um, you might have, you know, device that's just kind of acting as either a bridge. So you can do bridging in MQTT where you may have, you know, bridge to bridge, right? Which obviously means you need to pass, you know, security principle information, et cetera, over that potentially. Um, but generally you will have something like a broker uh, and the broker is the guy that's basically going to dispatch and route things where they need to go. Um, that's a, as simple of an invitation as you can get. Uh, but the thing too to take away, like we said before, is you may be talking all the way back to like, you know, the mobile devices. Um, so potentially in some implementations, in theory, you have the ability to send something malicious from either mobile application or web service and potentially talk back to say, you know, pick a sensor, right? Um, might have options to basically send information back to them. Uh, so here's an example of what kind of the public subscribe looks like. So um, you might have a sensor over here. Uh, so these guys first have to basically subscribe to what's called a topic, right? Uh, so these guys might care about, you know, for example, temperature updates, right? So these devices will tell the broker that we care about these updates. And the broker will say, okay, anytime I get updates for these things, um, and somebody publishes, which would be the sensor over there, um, we're going to give you updates about those things, right? Um, so that's kind of how to sort of have a public subscribe type of protocol works. Um, when there's something to be published, then the subscribers get that information, right? Um, but I mean, the things to take away there are, you know, again, right? So you have, you know, multiple tiers. You have um, the internet, which is probably to the right. Um, and then you have, you know, so it depends if you're using like a cloud broker, if you're using something like on-prem that basically goes upstream to another type of broker or bridge. Um, it's really, I guess, implementation specific. Uh, but obviously you have things like, again, like, you know, where do you authorize? Where's the authentication come from? Uh, what's actually encrypted, what's not? Um, the broker filters things, uh, holds on to session state, and um, the big thing there is around authentication and authorization. Um, so the broker has a lot of responsibility to make sure all those things happen um, across your connections. Um, QoS is a good thing. Um, so basically, uh, in, for making the broker store things, you have to at least connect it to it once. Um, so the broker will actually queue up messages for you as well. Um, so if devices like, you know, uh, inaccessible, et cetera, um, the broker potentially queues those things. So when you connect again, um, it pushes those messages out to you. Now, if you could disrupt that process, then that's fun. Also, lots of variants in MQTT across the different request types. So um, there's actually 14 different types of control packets. Some have payloads, some have a little bit of header stuff, some have they're actually very different if you look at all of them in terms of, uh, a couple are pretty similar, but um, they all have a lot of variance in terms of like uh, what the actual request looks like. Um, so just a little more terminology here. So topics are, so for example, let me just skip to this one here. Um, so think of like, for example, a topic might be, um, you know, something like World Cup teams, uh, right? And um, you may be interested in getting updates on, I don't know, England or something like that, right? So you subscribe to that. Uh, you can support uh, different wildcards as well. So the one on top, uh, that'll let you basically do you know, any number of levels. So basically if there are a couple different topics behind that, it will let you just wildcard the whole thing out. And um, whereas the plus sign lets you basically do a single level. So um, you can basically substitute like one level of topics with a plus sign. Um, where that comes into play is um, when you start doing authorization types of stuff as well. Um, definitely considerations around what you're exposing and how. Um, can also basically, I mean, if you want to just scan across for topics, um, you can send a lot of requests and kind of enumerate what's there. Um, so some of the, obviously like, you know, it, it varies across like implementations, right? Uh, some implementations don't have anything in there from like locking out an account, right? So um, you'll essentially do authentication. So for example, like with like Mosquito, uh, you put all your users in there, stuff like that. Um, but you can also, in some scenarios, you know, back end to like LDAP, database for authentication. It just, 
it really varies on the implementation. Now, obviously, if you're doing you know LDAP on the back end and you have like a lockout policy, well then you know then that's going to handle it for you. But um, you might not always have that depending on what uh, platform you're using. Uh, so talk about TMS a little bit. So um, here's an example at the bottom, right? So just kind of skip to that one. You guys get that batteries die. Um, but here we have something we see like a lot in mobile land, a lot, I mean, everywhere, right? So um, use TLS 1.2, get your certificate set up, and then basically use the insecure flag. So basically that says like, I don't care about certificates, just <laughs> basically I want to talk to whoever on the other end and I just don't give a shit. So um, that's a, basically a thing and it's amazing because like go on Stack Overflow, like I love going on Stack Overflow for these things. Like sometimes I like to even show them like just the comments of my presentations, right? But uh, it's Stack Overflow is a gem of like vulnerable code, by the way. Um, but that's just an example. I mean, people do this kind of stuff where it's just like turn off certificate checking and um, you guys know what men in the middles look like at that point, right? Um, but I mean, PSKs, sure. A um, little bit less, I guess, in terms of the crypto that has to happen as opposed to say asymmetric. Uh, but at the same time, like you're going to hear excuses like the battery is going to die and we can't do this. Um, by default, it sends in the Canuck header, it sends your username and password. Uh, so, I mean, you read different things like send a hash or, um, but then you read like send an MD5 hash. Like, is that really any better than, you know, sending the plain text, whatever. Um, but in any event, uh, that is sent basically in the Canuck headers uh, in the plain text. Um, Certificate-based authentication is nice. Not everybody does it. Uh, some implementations actually force you to do it, right? Um, for example, uh, AWS, uh, everybody gets their own certificate, which is good. Uh, in terms of authorization, so you can restrict, um, and this is very implementation specific to how granular and how easy it is to actually maintain, um, but you can actually set for you know, individual topics who can actually subscribe to them, right? Um, whether it's by class of device, users, et cetera. Um, but you can put some restrictions in place to who can get what. Um, so it varies with mileage, right? Um, in terms of how granular that is and how easy it is. Um, here's an example of uh, just basically um, uh, an authorization plugin. Uh, so here, just basically, you know, setting an ACL, of course, with wildcards and all that good stuff, right? Um, so basically saying, hey, anybody with that uh, can just basically skip um, any ACL check. So you can imagine, you guys have all implemented probably authorization once in your lives. Like, um, these things are obviously error prone, right? Um, some implementations uh, give you a little bit more. Some uh, make you use plugins, right? Um, so it is possible, but uh, you will run into a lot of applications, a lot of devices just um, you know, so think of like the insecure direct object references of the world, um, you know, all those kinds of attacks, like depending on what you're basically shoving into in the back end, are all basically in play as well. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, hopefully you guys kind of grasp that, you know, new pro, I mean, these protocols aren't that new to be honest. Like MQTT's around, been around since the 90s, and now it's like the new hotness, right? But in reality, it's not that new. Um, Co-op's been around for quite a few years as well. It's just they've gotten really, really, really popular, you know, really in the past two years. So, um, ordering your libraries. Uh, so there's some, in, I'll say this, there's some interesting bugs <laughs> in some really popular uh, libraries out there. Um, short of basically talking about them all, uh, there's, there's definitely some dragons and probably some of your code out there. Um, in terms of things we know about architecture, in terms of things we know about application security, so, it's just new technology, like same concepts that we know, right? So we understand authentication, we understand authorization, uh, we understand, you know, sanitizing, neutralizing dangerous characters when we send them back to a DB or something like that, right? So that stuff's not brand new, um, but the implementations are really good changes. And compared to supporting, you know, an Android device or an iOS device um, or a browser, right? Um, some devices just don't have the same security oomph that you might get, um, you know, out of the things that are, you know, think of like a lot of devices, I mean, uh, if anybody does this kind of work, I mean, you'll see, you know, old Linux kernels, right? Um, you'll see devices that you find out there's just no way to basically do updates. Uh, so, you know, sort of sending like a field technician out there to, you know, basically, you know, do manual reloads, right? You're, a lot of times you're going to have OSs that, you know, 
things like ASLR, right? You're like, woohoo, all the modern OSs have that, but uh, you might have something that just doesn't support, you know, ASLR, right? Which obviously brings a lot of other things with it. So um, that is all I've got, and I'll be happy to take any questions you guys have. Yes. It looks like um, Coap has a couple of standard ports that it use, uses, but uh, does MQTT have anything like that? Uh, yeah, M 1883 and then uh, 8883 for um, secure. Those are standard, but I mean, you can change them, you know? Um, but they have their, yeah. Uh, so, MQTT, why is a broker? And so, Coap can operate without a broker? Is that correct? It can, also. I mean, you want to be able to do a resource directory, but in theory, Coap can talk. Right, you can you can actually get by without like a broker in the middle per se. But if you requires a broker because it's session state, it has to right. The broker has a lot of responsibility at that point. Yeah, totally. Um, any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Listen to me.